Well, thank you very much, Hal. Can you uh, see my screen okay? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, great. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for, for tuning into the webinar today. I'm very excited to uh, have this opportunity to talk about this research project of ours. Um, this project started back just over a year and a half ago, and we've recently been able to uh, get some results that we feel are quite interesting. Um, we're currently in the process of trying to publish these results and, and looking forward to, to next steps. So uh, what I'm going to do today is run you through this project that um, is going to be discussing the crowdsourcing, the collection of public transportation data. I'll provide a little bit of background and in, in context to why we were interested in this, and then I'll talk a little bit about our methods and and the types of technology that we've been using and creating, and then some of the results that have come out of that. And then I hope to leave you with some interesting points that can get you thinking about how we as researchers, practitioners, planners can really start thinking about new and innovative ways to collect data to really help improve the sustainability of, of our transportation systems. So um, before I begin, um, as Hal mentioned, I'm uh, an assistant professor at the Department of Geography at the University of Oregon. Most of my work focus, focuses on spatial um, analytical methods and the use of geospatial technologies, all for collecting, analyzing, and visualizing data related to different types of geographic issues. Um, and so the team that we put together for this grant involved uh, a partnership between um, the University of Oregon, we have several folks here I'll talk about, and also several folks from um, Lane Transit District uh, here in, in, in Oregon. Um, and so um, just to give you a brief background to who these people are, we have uh, Ken Cato, Associate Director of the Infographics Lab, the lead developer from the Infographics Lab, Jacob Bartruff, a uh, professor from the um, 3PM um, the Planning and Public Policy and Management Department, Mark Schlossberg, a couple of research assistants, Seth Kenbeek, Nathan Musser, and John, and then we had a couple of really wonderful people helping us out from Lane Transit District, both uh, Tom Schwetz and, and Andy Vobora, who um, are part of their planning and, and customer service team um, that really allowed us to do a lot of things to help test out our technology. So I just want to say a big thanks to them and to everybody on the team for, for all their contributions. And what I'd like to do is sort of kind of put us in the mindset of, of thinking about data and how we actually capture data. I'm going to talk about some more traditional ways that transportation agencies have, have captured data over time. But I kind of want us to think a little bit about this, this new world of wired network and, and big data uh, and how all these types of concepts drive this, this, this idea of a, of a smart city. Um, within this drive, cities, um, what they can try to do is improve their urban transportation systems um, by collecting more and more data about individuals and trying to learn how individuals move around spaces. Uh, and the, sort of when we talk about transportation behavior data, uh, what we're referring to is something beyond the sort of typical data that's looking at people getting on and off transportation vehicles. And I'm talking primarily here in, in terms of buses. Um, but we were thinking about improving the way in which we collect the data on understanding who is there and, and why are they traveling there. Um, when are people traveling? So if we can understand uh, you know, different types of people, where they're going at different times of the day. And also, how are people traveling? And thinking about, you know, somebody taking a bus, is somebody taking a train, but how are they actually getting to these modes of transportation? Are they walking? Are they cycling? Are they, uh, you know, carpooling? Um, so we're trying to really consider how uh, public transportation agencies can enrich the data they collect about individuals and how this data can actually be useful to them to, to improving their, their, how they deliver their, their systems. So historically, most of us are maybe familiar with this, um, you know, the most common form of collecting transportation data about individual commuters has been through manual counts you know, involving 
staff agency uh, manually calculating the number of commuters entering and exiting transportation vehicles. And this has always been a you know, very useful source of data. Uh, agencies can estimate daily ridership numbers at specific stops and determine if changes in vehicle frequency or the, the number of stops, for example, would be beneficial to the overall system. Uh, and so uh, this was somewhat replaced in the, I wouldn't say replaced, but it's um, uh, something that was put into place in a lot of agencies starting in, in the 1970s and grew in popularity over time were these automated counting systems. Um, so this, this image on the right is sort of a, a kind of a schematic of that. Um, these automated, automated uh, passenger counting systems, or APCS, um, they started to become a lot more prevalent across the United States and in Europe um, as these technologies sort of grew in, in their affordability and the, the sort of ease of use for installation and how they were actually able to capture data. And again, what these would do is capture individuals getting on and off buses. Um, and they became more useful. There were some, there are some issues um, with, with um, you know, installing these and actually maintaining them. There's a lot of post data processing that needs to happen to make them useful. Um, but really what they're able to do, this is a, a map of um, the Eugene Springfield area here in Oregon. And this is the kind of data that, you know, when we're thinking about manual counting devices or automated counting devices. This is what we're able to capture. And it's, we're able to look at all these different bus stops. So all these circles represent a bus stop in the network. And we know how many people got on or got off that bus um, during a particular time of the year when the sampling was actually done. And so you can look at this and you can you know, think of many um, uses for, for this data set. Uh, the, these methods are, we could argue, perhaps two of the more popular, the manual automated counting um, ones that have been implemented over the years. A couple of barriers still exist, especially with the automated counting devices. Um, while they are more affordable, smaller agencies find these, these technologies still to be limiting somewhat to being able to implement. And as I alluded to, there's a lot of post-collection processing that actually needs to, to take place. There's a lot of bias, sampling bias that happens in the data set. And a lot of this um, kind of falls into the hands of staff at agencies for, for them to be able to, to figure out how these biases exist. So while we've got some benefits of, of these technologies, uh, we're also constrained in some way. And, and also, um, I think, or just to emphasize the fact that really what we're able to produce is, is data, how many people are getting on and off stops. We're somewhat limited to actually think about how, you know, I was saying about how are people getting to bus stops? What kind of transportation are they using? Um, and so we can think about, you know, are, are people cycling to bus stops? Um, you know, are, are they uh, taking other modes of transportation? Our traditional modes of, of data collection aren't able to do this. Um, also, how is their experience while they're on the bus? Um, is the experience been um, a positive or a negative one? Um, and so there's, there's much more data that we're interested in collecting that these traditional um, approaches are not able to do. And so what's evolved over the past 10 years or so are these sort of next generation of data collection methods. And a lot of these methods are based around location aware uh, devices or location based systems, both of which I'm going to talk a, a little bit about. Um, and people, agencies and sort of data uh, providers and, and, and um, different people that get involved with data analytics are all realizing the real potential for trying to utilize people's location. And how can we capture individual location to, to help enrich the data that we're collecting? Um, so most of us are familiar with smart cards. And smart cards are um, perhaps, you know, we're seen as a really um, great way to think about trying to understand or try to capture more data about individuals in, in transportation networks. Um, and when you think about it, these uh, smart cards that people, this is, here's an example from, from London, England, the Oyster card. Um, what people do is you, they use these cards, they swipe them, um, you know, you put multiple trips on that card, and 
you often have to swipe when you get into a system and when you get out of a system. Each of these cards has a unique ID, and so agencies can try to understand where people are getting on and off. So they can actually try to construct a database of actual trips, not just where they're getting on and off, but how far uh, these people are, are actually traveling. Um, and so they're very, these smart cards, they've been sort of very popular in terms of collecting data for transportation agencies around the world. There's a lot of um, studies that have taken place in, in Asia, that uh, places like China and, and Singapore that have tried implementing these as a way to, for agencies to collect more data. They're very cost effective. If you think about them, they're already being used for another purpose. Um, so why not sort of jump on board and try to use them to, to help us collect more data? But again, one of the limitations, and this kind of falls back into the same thing with the manual and automated counting uh, devices, is that commuters are, they're still these passive providers of data. So what we're actually doing is we're, we're just collecting um, data on individuals where they are at specific moments in time. And as I was discussing earlier, really what we're interested in is creating more of a uh, more depth with the type of quality and quantity of data that we're actually able to get. And so where we're at with the state of the art um, with, with thinking about technologies and collecting data for transportation agencies are thinking about these location-based services. And location-based services are you know, everything from Google Maps where you're entering a location um, into something to try to figure out where to go or to a, you know, any kind of mobile app that utilizes your uh, phone's GPS or location through other means to try to use that location for providing some information. Um, and so here's a few examples of different mobile applications that have been created for different transportation agencies. And um, perhaps the, the one agency that's really embraced the use of these are, is, is TriMet in Portland, Oregon. Um, and if you go to their site, they list about 57 apps that you could utilize and to some degree to, to try to learn something about their transportation network or, or to provide some data. Um, of all the apps on this website, um, most of them are, are really limited to a one directional flow of data. They, um, the, the app itself is pushing alerts, whether it's you know, transit information, what time the bus is coming. It's a, it's a one way flow of information from the application to the user. Uh, only one of these applications, there's one called Rotify, uh, provides opportunity for commuters to actually volunteer data about their current trip, uh, which can be used by other riders in the transit system to learn, um, you know, if there's a problem somewhere in the system, um, they could learn that maybe they want to avoid that, that part of the network or um, seek some other type of means of, of commuting. Um, but most of these are, are, are one directional. In, meaning that the information is coming from the, the, the actual application to the user. The user's not able to, to provide much data. There has been a lot, of, um, a lot of people kind of looking into different ways in which we can get people to contribute more data. Uh, how can we get people who are on a bus to, t um, to tell us more and more about how their experience is going. Um, and people have been using a lot of, you know, they've turned to social media, things like Twitter, Foursquare, for those of you who are familiar with that, um, and really trying to understand, can we utilize social media as a way to collect data about people? And this is a new area in, in thinking about data collection, especially in a system where people are mobile and moving through a system. Um, and there's, you know, many, many uh, examples of, of people trying to make this happen. And I think from, you know, a very extensive literature search on the successes and, and limitations of these different methods, one of the biggest challenges with trying to get people to volunteer data about themselves, whether it be through social media or other means, is really this idea about privacy. 
And if you have somebody on Twitter um, posting a message and let's say a transportation agency wants to take that message and they want to learn something about this person, um, about where they were when some event happened in the transportation network, that individual is foregoing their location information. And so there's this, this whole uh, sort of uh, dialogue right now thinking about how much are people actually willing to volunteer where they are at specific times of the day in order to generate any kind of data, especially for a you know, public transportation agency where they might not quite see the immediate benefit of, of doing so. So here we have all these technologies that have sort of evolved over time. We've got location-based systems and services. We've got these mobile apps that are really, really innovative. Many people have mobile phones, smartphones now in their pocket they're carrying around every day. So we could put the collection of data in the hands of individuals, but we're having to negotiate this whole issue about privacy and how, how can we actually think about collecting data about people, but you know, being respective of, of their privacy and not trying to um, you know, ask them to, you know, can we track you throughout your transport, your throughout your commute? Can we track you before you get on a bus and after to find out where you're going? There's a whole sort of trade-off between the richness of data that we want to collect, but while at the same time trying to uh, respect the privacy of riders. So this this sort of big thought process and literature review that we conducted really brought us to this question about how do transportation agencies collect more strategic forms of data about their ridership while respecting the privacy of its riders. And so going forward, we put in a proposal to, to NITSI and um, received funding to think about how we were going to do this. We wanted to have a study that was going to evaluate how uh, LBS location-based services can be utilized to solicit data from transit commuters while uh, respecting their location privacy. So we assess how two different forms of um, existing location-based services offer ways to capture snapshots of commuter locations. Um, and what we, we did this project over a one-year period by by coming up with some methods that were really focused around trying to um, uh, think about how we can get an app in the hands of people in a way that is technologically sound, in a way that's going to allow them to be able to, to push information to us while at the same time, again, um, you know, not infringing upon their privacy. So I'm going to go through some methods here, and the methods actually um, are, uh, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the app and the questions that we wanted to ask, but what I'm going to talk a little bit more about is the, um, is the technology behind it. And what we needed to do as first steps was really try to figure out how can we test this, what technology is going to work. So we created this mobile, this mobile app, we had this developer um, uh, create this in an iOS, uh, you know, in, in Apple's um, uh, the smartphone system, and uh, the app itself is very basic, it's very rudimentary, um, and what we, we didn't want to think too much about the types of questions that we were asking, we wanted, we wanted to ask some basic questions, but it's more so about how do we get this, this survey to come up on people's phones at strategic times and get that data from the phone to a database that we can then use to analyze. So our, our sort of big overall objective in terms of methods was to create this customized mobile application um, that was developed uh, for, so that users that are or commuters can actually connect to some, some network that would allow them to provide information. And so this app that we see here, um, when an individual gets on or near a bus, we wanted to push this app and say, you know, are you about to get on a bus? Yes, take the survey. No, um, if we made a mistake in pushing you the survey, then you could say no and, and the survey would close. And the kind of survey that we were interested in really was this, uh, is basically something that looks like this. Um, and so 
you know, after we asked somebody, they got a push notification, and we said, are you on the bus? Uh, we wanted to ask them questions like this. Where did you come from? Did you come from home, work, or school? We're not asking for their specific location, but generally, where was it that you came from? Where are you going? How did you get to the bus? So did you walk? Did you take a car? Did you bike? Um, was it another bus or another transit system that you, you, um, that you took to get there? Okay. Um, so how long did it actually take you to get there? Was it five minutes? You know, was it five to 15, 15 to 30? Or what did it take longer? And what was your overall experience? And then we could leave some comments to if people had some specific things that they, that they actually wanted to ask. Um, so, again, a very, very basic survey, and we could, you know, uh, as we move forward, think about how do we ask more strategic questions that are based on what agencies want to know about people. But the idea here was to push something that's quick. Um, people can actually, uh, you know, they can complete this uh, survey within about 30 seconds to a minute. And the other thing that we thought about is when people get on a bus, and we noticed this as we were writing the the bus more frequently during the study, as people get on the bus, what's really intriguing is the number of people as they get on and they find out where they're going to sit or where they're going to stand, the majority of people that we were just sort of observing as part of this project, the first thing they would do was pull out their phone. And, and then I found myself doing the exact same thing. Uh, as soon as you find yourself in the position that you want to be on the bus, people pull out their phone and they do whatever they do. They, you know, they look, go to Facebook, they read their email, they check a text. And so we thought, wow, at that moment when they pull out their phone, right before they go to do what they want to do, can we not, act, can we not utilize that time where we've got a captive individual and ask them some questions about, um, about their commute? So, that's the survey, the, and again, the app creation process was something that wasn't terribly difficult. What was difficult was to figure out how do we get this to actually happen. And so what we did is we had two different types of uh, location-based services. One of them, um, here's an acronym here, it's uh, Bluetooth Low Energy Beacons. And so many of us know from Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth is a company, um, and now we use the term Bluetooth um, quite frequently to refer to different technologies that communicate through each other with each other through some sort of um, active wavelengths. Um, think about your if you have a wireless mouse that connects to a computer um, that you're using, that's through some sort of technology where some kind of wavelengths are being communicated back and forth. And so Bluetooth beacons are these are actual physical sensors, and um, they're the sensors that I showed uh, on the second slide or third slide of the presentation, and what they do is they can send a signal out, and that signal can actually be received by a mobile device. So if you put a Bluetooth sensor on a bus, and an individual with a phone enters a bus and they've got this app on their phone, you can actually notify that individual because you could send, you could um, determine that they're on the bus and you could push them the survey. The other technology that we wanted to test out was something called geofences. A geofence is a digital perimeter. And so if, if you can think about, you know, on your computer, if you see a map of all the bus stops in a network, you could create a circle around that bus stop. Let's say it represents 50 meters. And so what you've actually got is a 50 meter perimeter around that circle, and that serves as a geofence. When somebody with our app actually goes close to that bus stop, and they enter into that geofence, we could actually push them a notification to allow them to, to take this survey. So these two technologies are similar in that what we're trying to do is get uh, try to push people um, who have our app on their phone, the, the survey so we can collect data. But one of them, the blue, um, Bluetooth uh, low energy beacons, involves actually putting some infrastructure on a bus, whereas the geofence actually involves us on our computers uh, creating these buffer zones or these fences around individual bus stops. And then what we can do is 
we can embed those bus stops in our app. So when people come into a certain radius of those stops, we can actually send them a, a notification. Okay, so I'm going to go through a quick little uh, sort of um, schematic here, or a little example of how both of these work. I apologize for the sort of cartoonish-like uh, nature of these slides, but I, I do think it helps us to, to better understand um, sort of what we're looking at. So, um, you know, you can think about an individual getting wanting to get close to a bus stop. Uh, they want to they want to ride on um, some sort of a transit network. We want to ask them these questions. So where did you come from? Where are you going? And so forth. And what we want to utilize are the, their, the smartphone that's in their back pocket. When, when they get close enough or on the bus, we want to be able to push them a notification to ask them these questions. And so a geofence, again, is this digital perimeter that exists around a stop. And as soon as somebody passes through this geofence, so through this sort of digital perimeter, as soon as they come into contact with that, um, our phone, that the app on the phone will say, I know that the person's location is within this fence. I'm going to push them a notification to ask them some questions. The Bluetooth sensor, here's a, here's a picture on the right of what the sensors look like that we actually utilized. And um, we put these sensors um, on different buses. And as soon as somebody comes within a certain distance of that sensor, um, they get the push notification on their phone. Okay, so again, geofence and, and Bluetooth sensors, two different ways. Um, these Bluetooth sensors that we used are, are quite small. They're, you know, just over an in inch wide and a couple inches long. There's much smaller ones than this. We chose these ones because they were, they were quite durable. And we could put them on the bus and, and you know, um, they would sort of withstand any kind of bumping around or anything like that. And really our goal is if you've got all these people, so you've got all these individuals trying to get to different bus stops in this very complex network of a transportation uh, system, how can you get all these people to get push this notification, conduct a survey, and give the transit agency a lot of data? So we had to come up with a workflow for how both of these are going to work. I'm not going to go into detail a lot about this, but for the Bluetooth beacons, and for the sort of the geofencing, um, and I can sort of, if anyone's interested, uh, you can look at this um, after the, the webinar, and I'd be happy to answer some questions during the question period. But essentially, we had to come up with a with a workflow, and the way both technologies work requires us to do different things in terms of when we actually push the survey and when we actually close the survey down. Um, the biggest challenge for us with implementing this is, isn't so much when people get on the bus or enter the transportation network, it's when they actually exit the bus. And when they exit the bus, we have to find ways to, to figure out that person is now disconnected with the transportation network. So either with the beacon um, example, um, we'll have to determine, are they a certain distance away from the beacon? If so, we're going to assume that they have now ended their trip. Um, and with the geofence, it works very differently. What we end up doing is saying, has a person gone through a geofence in the last five or 10 minutes? If they haven't, we're assuming that they have then exited the bus. Both of these approaches have their own limitations and constraints on us being able to collect um, accurate data, um, but both have um, uh, their own unique advantages as well, which I'll talk a little bit about when we get to our, our discussion at the end here. So what we did was we implemented this method in a case study um, for a three-week period on the Lane Transit District's MX line, which is their rapid transit line that goes from Eugene Station in downtown Eugene it goes out to Springfield Station um, in the city just east of, of Eugene, up to, uh, oops, I beg your pardon, up to uh, Gateway Station, which is around one of the big malls and the, the shopping centers in the area. And so we had 25 participants, university student and staff, um, and some LTD staff participated as well, but mostly it was university students that we that participated in this in this case study, and we split uh, half of the people use the geofence approach, and half the people use the 
the Bluetooth approach, they didn't know at the time of the survey what method they were actually using. So we didn't want to bias um, some of the questions that we were going to ask them. So after three weeks, uh, or during the three-week period, people got on the bus. Whenever they got on, we encouraged them as much as possible to use the, the application to provide data. And so what I'm going to show are some very simple examples of the data that we can collect. We're not going to get into too much of the um, kind of visual analytics with, um, in this webinar. It's something that we're still kind of considering right now. But what we wanted to do was to see how, if we're able to get this data and how does some of this data actually look. So just like the map we looked at earlier on, um, this is just to basically show that you know, with this technology, we can recreate the sort of ons and offs, the, the count of how many people get on and off at each bus stop um, in the system. So this, is, this isn't anything exciting, but this is just to sort of show that we're able to do the same thing that we did with the, the traditional counting systems. Um, but then we can start thinking about things like this. So we can think about the number of trips that, that occurred um, you know, during our, our study period. You could think about this on a daily period, a weekly period, whatever you want. We could see the number of people that, um, you know, how long it took them to get to the bus stop. Was it 15 to 30 minutes, 5 to 15, or less than 5? And how did they actually get here? So here we know that most of the people, and, and this makes sense because most of them are students, most of the people uh, walked, and it took them less than five minutes to actually walk to the bus stop. I'll just go back here for a second to show you that here's the University of Oregon, and here's Dad's Gate bus stop, and there's another bus stop here. A lot of the residences are in here, so what we're looking at is a lot of people walking a very short distance to get to those stops. So that's intuitive, it makes sense, but if you extrapolate this out to a bigger network, you could think, you know, you'd be providing a, a much richer sense of who the ridership is and how they're getting there and how long it's taken them to get there as well. Uh, you know, we get a sense of, uh, you know, the number of trips with did people come from home, did they come from school, did they come from work, or did they come from somewhere else? We can make this, uh, these questions a lot more detailed, but, you know, what we can see here, and again, this is very intuitive that um, we're looking at students that came from their dorms or from home and they're kind of going back and forth from home to school. Okay. In terms of the sort of visual analytics of, of what we're trying to develop, where things are going to get more interesting for us and hopefully for, for um, transportation agencies, is actually having some sort of visual analytical interface. Where what we can do is demonstrate um, the size of the circle here we can see is actually the number of people, and then the, num the color of the circle is how long it actually took people to get there. And we can break this down based on you know, did people bike, did they walk, did they drive to, uh, to the bus station, or did they, um, you know, uh, did they get a, a ride or a carpool or whatever it might be. But we can actually try to understand a lot about this whole network in, in, a, in a whole new way. And understanding, you know, where is, where in the, in the bus network are people mostly arriving by bike? Do we need more bike um, infrastructure on our buses to accommodate them? Um, what's are a lot of people driving to this uh, particular station to take the bus? Are they coming from some distance far away? Do we need to provide more resources to allow them to do that? Are there certain problems that are occurring in, in the network more so than others? Um, we could try to sort of break all this stuff down from this data by creating some rich uh, kind of infrastructure uh, to help visualize, um, you know, how people are interacting with their transportation network. We can also do a lot of assessments on error. And so, um, you know, it's not just about blindly collecting data, and I'm not going to get too much into this now, but we could actually see that, you know, there was very few cases where we had people that were taking trips that were, you know, 100, 200, 300 minutes long, which is far beyond what people should actually be um, on the bus for. So we know that these are erroneous trips. And we can look at where do they start, where do they finish, and, and sort of, you know, we can look into the nature of where error is occurring in our application, and we can try to fix it. We can also see, um, you know, this is a demonstration of different types of trips that were made throughout different times of the day. One thing we learned here was most of the students don't actually get up and take the bus before 10 o'clock in the morning. 
um, maybe because they're in class or because they're you know doing whatever. Um, but we could actually try to dissect the entire day um, in terms of what hour of the day people are taking trips to try to understand more and more about, about our application. Uh, this was, um, without getting into too much detail, this gets very useful because we could try to understand you know, during rush hour versus calmer hours of the day, does our application work better in sometimes versus versus others? And our preliminary results showed us that the time of the day doesn't really affect. Uh, you know, if it's a crowded bus or an empty bus during rush hour or downtime, that's not really having a, a big impact on the accuracy. Um, there's some, you know, different things at play that are maybe kind of creating some, some challenges with how our app works. Um, we can look at where errors occur, where problems with our app, you know, is it occurring in one specific place, like at the bus stations, or is it occurring at specific stops? And so we sort of looked at some kind of errors that our application generated, and we mapped them out and found out that, you know, there's, there, there are a few errors here and there. They're kind of spattered across the network, but it's, it's nothing of um, concern in terms of, you know, all the... Uh, all the problems or errors from our application are located in, in one place. So we could, you know, we're collecting data, we're cr collecting this crowdsourced data, we're collecting information on how our application works. We could use that to actually, you know, improve our application over time. We know all these errors in, in real time as well, so we should be able to modify our app to improve if there's any problems that are occurring. Um, and we can get customer feedback, or we get feedback from people that took the survey, but we can also, you know, if you think about implementing this in, in, into an agency, we could think about, you know, how can we actually get, get some, um, some feedback from, from people. So, you know, we asked people, when did the survey appear on your phone? Um, for, you know, most of the applications, the majority of participants said that the, you know, application appeared right when they got on the bus. So we know that's a good thing. Um, some of them, you know, for the, the geofencing said that, you know, it wasn't actually triggered um, until later. Um, some of them, it actually got triggered very early. So we know that there's some timing involved with when people actually receive the survey. So we can actually, we ask people a lot of questions and we can dissect, you know, are you getting the, the survey at an appropriate time? And if not, we can try to make adjustments to, to fix that. Um, we asked people how often did it, the survey appear while you were on the bus, um, and some people said it never appeared, while some say it came up um, from time to time. Again, another issue that uh, this feedback helps us uh, fix. I'm going to go through these a little quickly just because I've only got a few minutes left and I want to wrap up with a few thoughts, but um, generally the, the application works very well. If there are any critiques, it's really about the, the timing of the survey, and some people just said that, you know, the survey kind of came on later than I expected, or I was waiting for the bus and it popped up because another bus went in the other direction. All of these are, are very sort of technical issues that um, we foresee as, as quite fixable, kind of looking ahead and thinking about how we, how we um, you know, improve this application for hopefully um, implementing it in, in, in different agencies, both here in Oregon and, and elsewhere. So looking forward, we, we know that there are some promises and some challenges. Um, what we've done here is try to seek a middle ground. How do we actually get really rich data on individuals, of what, where they're going, what they're doing, um, how they're getting there, um, but at the same time trying to actually respect that they're, you know, they don't want to be giving up their privacy throughout their trip. Um, so all we're actually doing is trying to determine when individuals get on and off. And all this is anonymous. We don't actually don't have anything that's tied to the person's phone once the data comes into our hands. So we don't know who it is. Do know that we can track individual trips and a lot of information about that trip. So there, as I said, there's a trade-off here. Uh, there's a big trade-off between this sort of promise of you know, big data and us collecting a lot of data. You know, more data is better is the sort of mantra that's, that's out there right now. But we have to sort of you know, think about this, this promise of big data and the fact that we're asking people to relinquish their, their privacy, so how do we actually think about a compromise? Um, and the big thing is this, this compromise, you know, is this something that transit, to what degree are transit agencies interested in this? Are they, you know, what kind of questions do they want to get from, from their ridership? And 
how can we get those questions from people while still ensuring that these people want to use the application, that they've got an incentive to do so. So looking forward, what some of the things that we actually want to do, and I'll just wrap up here in my last couple slides, is that um, we want to think moving forward, you know, how can we evaluate the potential for people to do this? What incentives do people need? Do people just want to give information because they're they want to help improve their the you know the, the system that they write on, or are there other sort of you know economic incentives like fair reductions or or things of the sort for people that actually do adopt these the you know the using these technologies to provide information? Um, so we also want to do, one of the other big things for next steps is actually thinking about these data analytics. So now that we've got all this data and this data is coming in, and you know you can get this data in real time, how do we actually visualize it in a useful way? Uh, this is where we can sort of you know would hope to work with agencies to try to understand what do agencies want, what type of information are they looking for, um, and so how can we take this data and seamlessly um, how do we um, you know take this data and put it into the hands of agencies in a way that's useful for them to understand more and more about their, their ridership. So just to summarize, uh, our results from this, this study show that you know, we've, we've got these location-based services. Smartphones are in the majority of hands of, of you know, people that are riding uh, on, uh, through these transportation networks. How do we capture that as, as a means for, for, for creating um, and collecting data? Uh, and while we know we've got some steps ahead of uh, thinking about how we process and, and refine our data and our application, we really feel that you know, this type of application, um, when we are able to make it operational, um, is something that can be applied to in, in agencies, both at small scale, something like Lane Transit District that uh, is applied in places like Eugene and Springfield to sort of bigger transportation agencies in, in bigger cities. So with that, I just want to say again, thanks very much for, for your attention today. Um, it's been a real pleasure to work with NITSI and a big, um, you know, big, big thanks to NITSI for their financial support and their continued support in helping us get out this information to, to people like you. So um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll end it there and uh, happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Chris. For those uh, viewing the webinar, please feel free to submit your questions um, if you have them. And we do have a number of questions for you, Chris. So I know that you had talked about um, a lot about the technology in, in, a, in, a, in and of itself, but um, how did you recruit the users and how did you get people to uh, uh, upload the, or you, uh, download the app on their phone and use it in the first place? Can you just talk a little bit about that? Sure. So this was this was a research study. So we actually um, had to go through and get approval from the university to do this. And then what we did was we threw emails out through the university. Uh, we contacted LTD, and um, then we, you know, we got volunteers to do this. Um, and then what we had to do was we had this app that we had on a local website, and so they had to go to that website and download that app to their phone. Okay, great. So here, here's an interesting question from the audience. So, so this is uh, from Martin. I, I'm not going to say his last name because I don't. I, I'll probably butcher his last name. But he, he his question is uh, to play the devil's advocate here: Is preserving privacy in your app worthwhile in an environment in which privacy has been mostly undermined? Um, so. He gives an example. For instance, last time I checked, 90% of flashlight apps required vast access to my personal information to turn on an LED on his cell phone. So I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, in a uh, freshman class that I teach, uh, there's over 100 students in it, um, we talk all about geospatial data and technologies, and we talk a lot about this issue of security and privacy. Um, and the big question is, is how much are people concerned about the issue of privacy with using their applications? Um, and what we're seeing is over the years, we continue to ask this question in this class, and more and more the younger generation of smartphone users are seeing this as just part of everyday life. They use their smartphones and the applications on there 
for doing um, quite a lot of the things that um, people like myself um, you know, use very different means to do so. Uh, they go into their, their smartphone, they use their applications, they see giving up their location as, as something that is just part of this sort of every day of how they operate um, with them and their phone. And so there's this whole generational shift that, that's interesting to think about privacy and that are we getting more people that are less concerned about doing this? Um, and so that's where I said moving forward, it will be interesting to actually survey people to see you know, what is the likelihood, the potential um, that people will adopt this. And also I think that's, you know, I think that's what we're really trying to, to figure out right now. How much of that privacy do we actually need to, to be worried about? And if we do need to be concerned about people's location, then you know, what, what we've done at this part, with this part of our project, we have just collected an individual's location when they say yes we are on the bus and yes we have gotten off the bus. There's no other tracking and we don't actually tie in people's location to any ID for their phone themselves so we can't actually know who it is that was at a specific place. So this is going to be I think you know you could cradle the best technology in the world but until we figure out this this issue it's um, it's going to be challenging to to really be confident that people are going to be adopting these kinds of ways to, to help collect data. Great, yeah. Um, so the next question is, how frequently would you see surveys being effective so there's no survey fatigue among customers? That's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, we, you could ask people, is this your daily commute? And if it is your daily commute, do we need to be asking them every day? Um, and or maybe what it is is when people download the app, you could say, uh, you know, maybe you may, if, if this application could be part of an existing transit agency's um, application, we could say, you know, uh, can we ask you to provide data over a two-week period? And so every time that person uses the transportation system, they can actually provide data during that two-week period. Because there's not only survey fatigue, then there's also a redundancy in data. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that you know we would necessarily benefit from getting data from one individual every day over a one-year period. So I think what it is is trying to figure out, again, um, you know what the user feels comfortable with, but trying to really get their pattern of um, how they're actually commuting through the network over time. Once you've captured that, then you could say, you know, is it really necessary to, to continue on? Mm -hmm. All right. So this next question um, deals with uh, transfers. So how would either system deal with a person that would have to transfer from one bus to another, or does it? It is a big issue, um, and it is something that uh, out of this project, the reason why we did the rapid transit line was because we didn't actually have to address this question <laughs> during during our, our study. Um, and what we learned from our study that this, you know, the idea of geofences, if you put those geofences at a bus station where people are transferring, it will actually be very, very difficult to be able to track them from one bus to the next. Because you know you get multiple buses coming to an individual stop. Um, so in a more complex system where there are more buses and more transfer stations, Bluetooth sensors on buses that can identify that an individual is on bus 98 and then they've gotten off bus 98 and then onto bus 7, that type of technology would be a lot more uh, beneficial and provide us with a lot uh, sort of more accurate of a picture. So even though we didn't test it in transfer stations, um, what our study showed us that you know, in a, in a more complex network, uh, the geofences will be a lot more challenged, and in fact, these Bluetooth sensors would, would be a lot more appealing in terms of the technology. Okay. And then in regards to your technologies, which provided a lower level of error, the BLE or the geofencing? The geofencing provided a lower um, error record. However, um, what we realized is that they weren't always recording errors when they occurred. <laughs> so we had people that were off the bus, um, and they were off the bus for a while, and what happened was it never recorded an error, it just actually booted the person out of the app. 
Um, the I would say between the two, the, the beacons produced more errors, which was actually a good thing because it alerted us of where problems were in the system with that type of application. Um, so which then allows us to be able to address that. The errors were under 10%, so it's relatively low if you think about the amount of data you could potentially collect. Um, and so I would say out of the two, the, the, the beacon, although providing some errors in how it was used, um, actually knowing about those errors is more useful than, than not. And it would be interesting to see what the error level is in a more complex system too. So. Yes, exactly. When you've got more buses passing each other, is your phone picking up a beacon on another bus? Um, when you have multiple buses going through one geofence, um, you know, can can we find ways to actually figure out what bus is it that you're you're actually on? So there's all these questions that get more more complex as you get into a more complex network. Okay. So so our next question goes back to the recruiting, um, and this is from Cindy Pedersen. Did you consider recruiting employees at the River Bend Medical Center to broad respondent base? We didn't. Um, uh, the logistics about recruitment were basically somewhat constrained by us having to do um, an actual go through a review process for our study. Gable from Lane Transit District and the University of Oregon uh, provided us f um, to be able to actually um, get people a lot easier. Once you, for something like this, once we kind of broadened our, our scope, um, it made the types of questions and how we handle data a lot more complicated. Uh, mm -hmm. So as a first step, we were hoping to get a couple dozen individuals so that we could test out, you know, does the app work, which technology works better, um, you know, which one's going to cause problems in certain situations. The next, you know, one of the next steps is now broadening, broadening out the surveys to sort of more people, not just on the actual um, sort of express line, but throughout the entire network when there are transfers and whatnot. So moving forward, you know, if we do look at this again, the sort of LTD network, you know, Riverbend's a great example because it, it's in a very different part of the network that didn't receive a lot of um, traffic. But it's uh, people like that, people like places like that that we'll have to start uh, looking for. Great. I, I feel like I'm saying next steps quite often. But there are <laughs> well, so that's a great segue <laughs> to our last question, which I swear I did not plant this question. This comes from Ali Oliver. So what are your next steps for this app application? And do you plan on releasing this through places like App Store? So um, our, our goal would be, um, you know, be able to commercialize something like this at the end of the day. Um, we learned a lot from a technological standpoint about how to what's what what works and what doesn't. Um, and so the next steps in order to make this operational, it's you know I th what we would need to do is one understand the clientele, so the users of these technologies on buses what are they likely to do and not to do. So there's, there's the user standpoint that we have to conduct, um, you know, user survey or study group or whatnot. Secondly, what we would need to do is put this in a bigger network. And then we need to figure out, you know, it's something with transfer stations and something with, with more buses, uh, what problems are we actually going to be able to get. And third, there's the sort of visual analytics part of it. And I think this is, that might be more sort of, kind of agency in terms of what agencies looking to capture from their data and what kind of way can we um, then think about creating visualizations so that it's very useful for, for people not having to do a lot of kind of post-processing of the data. They can actually take this data and, and get some very useful visual analytics that help them make important decisions about their systems. So those three things, the user, um, the complexity of the system and the visual analytics, um, these are the next steps that we need to accomplish. And in doing that, I feel quite confident that this is something that, that does have quite a lot of commercial appeal. Great. 
want to thank you again, Chris, for presenting uh, the results of your research. It's very interesting, and I know that a lot of the folks who tuned in are very interested in following where your research will go from here. So this does conclude our webinar. I know that we have two remaining questions that didn't get unanswered. We'll um, get back to those folks um, with those those questions. But I just want to thank everybody for joining us today, and um, you can professional development offerings that we provide, offer through NITSI on our website at NITSI.us. This concludes our webinar and thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.